evening, everyone. We welcome you all to yet another, but a very one of its kind session at the conference today. This conference is the opening program of our project M3, Man, Male, Masculine, organized by the Goethe Institutes in India and Bangladesh. My name is Shormishta, and I'm the program officer of the Goethe Institute, Max Muller Bhavan, Kolkata. This evening, we bring you a text concert titled Becoming a Problem by Susanna Saxon. It is indeed something which will give you a range of thoughts and questions that you can take home uh, with you from this session. Well, I will not speak too much about the performance because we have the privilege of having the performer herself present with us today. And we thank her for her time since she has made herself available from far away New York. Before I hand it over to Susanna for her introduction to her performance, a few words about her. Susanna Sakse is a Berlin-based actress. In 2001, she co-founded the artist collective, Chi. Susanna has worked internationally in various performances, films, and art context with Yael Bhatana, Jonathan Berger, Zach Blas, Phil Collins, Karen Sata, Fagina Davis, Natasha Sadar Hagehian, Hannah Hutsish, Bruce LaBruce, and many other well-known international artists. She is a recipient of the Premio Magui Queer Icon Award at the Guadalajara International Film Festival. In 2021, she will open her first solo exhibition at the Participant Inc. in New York City. Before I hand it over to Susanna, please note, but after this performance from 7 p.m. IST, we cordially invite you all to join the panel discussion, Masculinity and Power, which is moderated by Urvashi Butalia and includes speakers like Madhvi Menon, Meena Kandasamy, Onindo Hajra, Dr. Sharful Khan, and Romit Chaudhary. The link to the session will be posted in the chat box at the end of the performance. And may I now invite Susanna Saxa. Susanna, the floor is all yours. Hello, good evening, dear guests of the International Digital Conference and free man, male, masculinity at the Goethe Institute Max Müller Bhavan in Calcutta. I am Susanna Saxa and I welcome you warmly to my video performance. Thank you for coming. And from my heart, I want to thank you Astrid Wege and Shamish Dashaka for inviting me. And thanks to all the people from the technical department to their wonderful preparation and support. Thank you. For my performance, I will speak to you with the words of Paul B. Preciado. Paul B. Preciado is a philosopher, writer, and curator. He is one of the foremost contemporary thinkers in the field of gender studies and sexual politics. A former Fulbright scholar, he studied at the New York School for Social Research in New York under the supervision of Agnes Heller and Jacques Derrida. He completed his PhD in philosophy and theory of architecture at Princeton University. He is the author of A Contrasexual Manifesto, 2001, Testo Junkie, 2008, Pornotopia, 2011, an Apartment on Uranus, 2020, and Can the Monster Speak, 2021. Contrasexualis Manifesto was the first book of Preciado, what I read, and it helped give me a new understanding of gender and masculinity. It is a great honor to speak here almost exclusively with Paul B. Preciado's words, which I took into my mouth swallowed down my throat and regurgitate for you now. And for a tiny moment at the end with someone else's words, 
her words, Ms. Vagina Davis. If you are not a woman, you are either a man or you become a problem. Paul B. Preciado. Another voice. I'm getting used to my new voice. The testosterone I administer is making my vocal cords thicker, producing a lower timbre. This voice emerges like a mask of air coming from within. I feel a vibration spreading in my throat as if it were a recording emerging from my mouth, transforming into a strange megaphone. I do not recognize myself. But what does I mean in this sentence? Can the subaltern speak? The question that Gayatri C. Spivak posed to examine the complexity of the conditions of utterance of the colonized people now takes a different meaning. What if the subaltern were also a possibility always already contained in our own process of subjectivation? How can we make it so that our trans subaltern can speak? And with what voice? What if losing your own voice as an ontotheological sign of sovereignty of the subject were the prime condition for letting the subaltern speak? Apparently, other people don't recognize this voice shaped by testosterone either. The telephone has ceased being a faithful, a misery. It has become a traitor. I call my mother and she answers, Who is it? Who is calling? The rupture of recognition makes explicit a distance that has always existed. I would speak to them and they would not recognize me. The necessity to verify puts filiation to the test. Am I really her child? Was I ever really her child? I have to hang up because I'm afraid I won't be able to speak. Other times I say, It's me. And right away I add, I'm fine, as if to prevent doubt or panic from getting in the way of acceptance. A voice that up to now was not my own is seeking refuge in my body, and I'm going to give it refuge. I travel constantly. One week I'm in Istanbul, another in Kiev, then Barcelona, Athens, Berlin, Kassel, Helsinki, Frankfurt, Stuttgart. Travel translate the process of change, as if external movement were trying to articulate internal nomadism. I rarely wake up twice in the same bed or in the same body. From all around, I hear the note of a battle that permanence and change are waging with each other, between same and different, between border and uncertainty, between those who can stay and those who are forced to leave, between death and desire. This apparently masculine voice reclassifies my body and frees it from anatomical verification. 
The epistemic violence of the binarism of sex and gender reduces the radical heterogeneity of this voice new to masculinity. The voice is the mistress of the truth. There comes to mind the possibility shared root testes of the Latin words testimonium, witness, and testiculum, testicle. In Roman law, only a person with testicles can speak before the law, just as the pill induced a technical separation between heterosexuality and reproduction. Cyclopentyl pro pionato, the testosterone I inject myself intramuscularly, induces the separation between hormonal production and the testicles. Or in other words, my testicles, if we mean by that the organ that produces testosterone, are inorganic, external, collective, and dependent in part on the pharmaceutical industry and in part on the legal and health institutions that give me access to the drug. My testicles are a small bottle of 250 milligram of testosterone that travels in my backpack. The issue is not that my testicles are outside my body, but rather my body is beyond my skin, in a place that cannot be thought of as simple mine. The body is not property, but relationship, identity, sexual, gender, national or racial is not essential, but relational. My testicles are a political organ that we have invented collectively and that allows us to produce an intentional form of social masculinity, an ensemble of modes of embodiment that by cultural convention we recognize as masculine. By mixing with my blood, this synthetic testosterone stimulates the interior hypothesis and hypothalamus so the ovaries stop producing eggs. There is however no production of sperm because my body possesses neva Sertoli cells, no seminal tubes. I imagine the day is not so distant when a 3D printer could make them from my own DNA. But for now, inside our carbon capitalist episteme, my trans identity must be fabricated from a much lower tech makeshift arrangement. Every morning, the tone of the first word I utter is an enigma. The voice speaking through my body does not remember itself. The changing face too cannot serve as a stable place for the voice to seek as a territory of identity. Or the contrary, it declines its subjectivity in the plural. It does not say I, but we are the journey. Perhaps that's what remains of the Western I, and that absurd claim to individual autonomy to be the place in which the voice is made and unmade, the place, as Derrida would have said, from which the deconstruction of the phonologophallocentrism operates. Dispossessed of the voice as truth of the subject, and knowing that my testicles are always a prosthetic social apparatus, I feel like a comical Derridean case study, and I laugh at myself. And in laughing, I feel my voice going off its rails in my throat. Athens, October 24, 2015. <laughs>
Trick? Wie schade? Wo stehst du jetzt? Du hast so viel Mühe reingesteckt. Lass zu nehmen. Dann kommen sie vorbei mit ihren Worten und Buchstaben und Identitäten und Kulturen. wonderful to wake up in the morning and know just which door you're going to walk through. She's so terribly normal. manuscript of the 120 days of Sodom is a 12 meter long paper roll composed of small pieces of paper glued together with writing on both sides in black ink. Sad wrote it in 37 nights in almost total darkness and in the tiniest handwriting during his imprisonment in the Bastille in 1785 hiding it inside a hollow wooden dildo to avoid detection by his jailers. Anything written by Saad was confiscated and risked immediately justifying new charges. Saad declared that he spent his time reading and writing, eating and masturbating more than six times per day, he said. It was for these masturbation practice that he asked his wife to make him a wooden dildo for anal penetration. Hidden inside one of the prison stone walls, the dildo protected the manuscript from the pillage of the Bastille and was ultimately recovered by Arnaud de Saint-Maximin and made public for the first time more than a century later in 1904 by German doctor Ivan Bloch under the pseudonym Eugène Duren. The lesson we learn from the survival of Saad's most challenging text is not only that the hollow dildo can be useful pens for hiding secrets or that any dildo can eventually contain a book, but also that the book can operate like a dildo by becoming a technique for fabricating sexuality. Like a dildo, 
A book is sexual bodies assisted cultural technology of modification. In this sense, this book too is a dildo. A dildo book and a book about dildos that aims to modify the subject who might use it. I was indeed someone else when I wrote this book. My legal name was Beatrice. I was supposed to be a woman. People identify me as a queer lesbian. And I was 28 years old. This book was not written as a piece of academic knowledge. It was an experiment. It worked like a fiction technique that allowed me to start a process of becoming other that's still underway. As the logic of the dildo proclaims, instead of cutting down trees, lives, desires, and sexualities, this book is a call to care and proliferate to connect and multiply. This manifesto is an angry and impertinent response to the heterocolonial castration of the living being's radical multiplicity and forms of production of desire and pleasure. We live in a world where violent gender diagnosis is legalized practice in every modern hospital, forcing gender assignment according to the binary. A world where, in spite of the technical separation of heterosexuality and reproduction that the pill enables, heterosexuality is still declared the normal and the natural form of sexual reproduction. A world where hormones, prothesis and surgeries enable and embodied experience of gender transition, but where normalization of gender is the political requirement for any gender reassignment process. A world where experiments with three-dimensional printing of skin and organs are already taking place, but always within the framework of hegemonic gender and racial norms, and yet we, the intersexed, the crip, the genderqueer, the non-white, the trans, exist, speak, and act. We are anti oedipus and the pharmacopornographic regime. Our bodies and subjectivities might not have political or anatomic existence, yet we live within and against the binary sex-gender regime. Dominant psychoanalytic narrative and its binary genital economy could be understood as the clinical device that accompanies the heteronormative colonial regime by defining instances of pathology and seeking a normalization treatment of the anxiety and psychic pain that the epistemology of sexual difference and its power knowledge regime generate. Dominant psychoanalysis and pharmacology operate as theoretic chambers in which the possibility of transforming to anguish and psychic pain that the dominant heterocolonial regime produces into political rebellion is deactivated and transformed into a process of subjective identification. Accept that you are a man or a woman. Assume your heterosexuality or your homosexuality. Enjoy, eroticize the violence of the binary regime. Confronted with the impasse of these debates, I turned to the dildo as a counter Augustinian object of anti castration conversion that was my own and yet foreign to me. This rather banal and material artifact seemed to perform a conversion of my female and lesbian sexuality 
into something other, something that was unbearable and unspeakable to the point that I had to remain clandestine. The dildo seemed to be equally bothersome to my Lacanian psychoanalyst and my feminist friends. For both, it was the bad signifier, a pathological symptom of my uncastrated desire for power and the replication of a dominant and phallic form of masculinity. As in the case of Saad and the Bastille, both psychoanalysis and feminism seemed to force me to write the discourse of the dildo in tiny script and hide it secretly within a dildo itself. Nevertheless, my experience of the dildo was radically different. I was interested in the non-identitarity grammar that the dildo introduces within bodies and sexuality. The dildo invades the disjunctive to have and to have not. It does not belong to the ontology of the essence or to the order of property. The dildo is and is not an organ that, although belonging to someone, can't be fully owned. The dildo belongs to an economy of multiplicity, connection, sharing, transference and usage. The dildo refuses to be inscribed into the body to create organic wholeness of identity. Sexualities are like languages. They are complex systems of communication and reproduction of life. As languages, sexualities are historical constructs. Like languages, sexualities can be learned. It is the language that we are unable to perceive as a social artifact the one that we understand without being able to fully hear its accent or melody. We entered the sexuality through the medical and legal acts of gender assignment, through education and punishment, through reading and writing, through image consumption, mimicry and repetition, through pain and pleasure. And yet, could have entered into any other sexuality under a different regime of knowledge, power and desire. Still, we can learn any other sexual language with a greater or lesser sense of alienation and strangeness, of joy and appropriation. It is possible to learn and invent other sexualities, other regimes of desire and pleasure production. The success of contemporary techno-scientific industry consists in transforming our depression into Prozac, our masculinity into testosterone, our erection into Viagra, our fertility slash sterility into the pill, our AIDS into tritherapy without knowing which comes first, our depression or Prozac, Viagra or an erection testosterone, or masculinity, the pill, or maternity, tritherapy, or AIDS.